皆様、大変長らくお待たせいたしました。Thank you very much for waiting. We would like to begin the Art and New Ecology Exhibition International Symposium Art, Ecology and Our Future. I am one of the organizers from the Tokyo University of Arts Graduate School of Global Arts. My name is Yuko Hasegawa. And today, it's a Sunday and it's late in the afternoon. Thank you for attending today. And this exhibition, I think most of you have seen the exhibition, and related to the exhibition regarding art and new ecology, how should we think about this? At this exhibition, as co curator, the professors who are involved as co curators, and regarding this exhibition, there is one more other project. And you can see that it's been given out to you. So, from Ibunsha, Art and New Ecology, there's a new publication. So, philosophers and、um, anthropologists have worked together and also supporting GA. There are professors, associate professors, students. And the ecology surrounding all of this, everyone involved has been involved in this exhibition. And this is a university museum, so the results of our research. We want it to be understood by ordinary people. So, in one respect, we wanted to make this public. We wanted to make things more democratic and share them. We think that's very important. In that respect, this time, in this way, the exhibition and this symposium are being held. And today, first, As the keynote speech, next to me is Professor Emmanuel Kocha. He will give us the keynote speech. And Professor Kocha, in Paris at the Ecot All Orogy Supérieure des Sciences, he is associate professor. And he specializes in med medieval philosophy. And he is the author of La Vie Sensible and also Metamorphosis. So, that, those are the books he's written. They've been translated into English as well. And the main Japanese translation of The Philosophy of Plant Life, he's already also the author of that. And he has ties with many artists. He's written a lot of texts about artists as well in 2019 for the exhibition Trees at the Cartier Art Foundation in Paris.、Um, he served as the、uh, person in charge of the academic side. And with this book, too, Right now, it's unclear regarding the future. So, regarding society, politics, the natural environment, our lives and our death, the environment surrounding us is undergoing great change. So, what should we do in the future? I'm sure lots of us are perplexed. So, it's not words, it's not logos, but through our five senses, through sensory learning, Artists who can propose a lot of different things, the power of artists plus the logic. In order to share this with you, together with experts, we think that curating like this together is very important. And this time, too, in one respect, these are very high contents. And by holding this in the form of an exhibition, we can get more people interested. So, in that respect, the people introduced in this book. And the panelists taking part today, everyone has their own logic, their own theory. And they also have practical collaboration with artists and exhibitions. And they are extremely interested in that respect, the curatorial ex execution, including that. We'd like to hold this panel discussion. And first, We will ask Professor Kocha to give us the keynote speech. And initially, we said it would be for 60 minutes, but he has prepared a lot of content for us, so we have expanded his time to 75 minutes. And then we will have a break, and then we'll have our four panelists, including Professor Kocha, and we'll start the discussion. And today, we had told you that from Firenze University, biologist, Professor Stefano Mancuso, he is not feeling well and he is unable to join us. And he 
is very disappointed. And including his ideas, I would like to explain a little bit about Professor Mancuso. He was looking forward to joining us online. It's a great pity. And he says uh, he wants me to give you his best regards. So we would like to begin. So Professor Kocha, please. Can you, can, should I see it? Ah, yeah. Can you hear me? So first of all, thank you so much for being there. A Sunday afternoon, it's like amazing. That means that the Earth is really a good future. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm extremely happy and honored to be here, and I'm extremely happy and honored to be in Japan. I used to live here from one month, 12 years ago, and I'm so happy to be back. I had to come back during COVID, but it was canceled. So, and I went to Thank a lot, Yuko, for inviting me. Uh, I'm really happy. And I w would also thank Yuko for this amazing exhibition. I just had a, uh, an hour to see. I hope to have the time to see uh, it again. It's uh, thank also to the artists. It's, uh, I was uh, saying to Yuko how refreshing and how original this uh, the perspectives uh, collected in this uh, 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 um, uh, exhibition is, is uh, it was overwhelming for me and it was uh, really important because I think in Europe at least uh, also in the States we are stuck in a sort of uh, upper year so that's uh, so I'm so happy and I have a lot of hope because of, the, of uh, this exhibition so thank you so much I will start I will not I, I, I will try to make it short and not uh, speak for 75 minutes because otherwise you will be uh, dead at the end of the of my speech so uh, the uh, the the my my speech is very I mean w would like to stress or to prove a very simple point that we I said it I will say it in a very rough way we should stop to speak about the ecology we just should think or speak about art and art should take power artists uh, should take power within the ecological field and transform ecology itself in a sort of uh, artistic practice. So art should become the name for general ecology. And uh, why? First of all, to say that um, I will try to, in, in a way, I will uh, uh, proceed in two parts, in two movements. First of all, if I'm saying that, because it's because I uh, uh, feel a sort of, uh, I have a feeling of dissatisfaction with a contemporary ecological paradigm. And I will try to show why we should criticize ecology, at least a very part of it. And I will try to show that in, uh, because of its historical uh, lack of consciousness, ecology is uh, a problem more than a solution for our problems. And we, uh, if we have to change ecology, to reform ecology starting from its name, it's because there are a couple of problems linked with the history of this uh, science, which we have to, uh, uh, in a way, to change. Uh, uh, so, but before starting criticizing ecology, we would just to stress two elements which are extremely important uh, uh, in uh, ecology, which uh, proves why ecology is today extremely important. First of all, uh, so I will tell you a little bit uh, later, a little bit more, but ecology was born in the 18th century. And it was born because people realized that in order to understand the relationship of all species on Earth among each other, but also the relationship among, uh, between all the species and the Earth itself, uh, you need another science beyond chemistry, biology, uh, physics, uh, or, or whatever. You need a sort of non-human social science. So ecology started realizing that there is a form of sociality between non-human beings. That's why we need ecology. And it was a sort of non-human sociology ante which is amazing. So 
in a way, and that's why if you think about the concepts of ecology, they are all social concepts applied to non-human. So in a way, you ecology taught us that, uh, I don't know, the wolves and the, and the sheep are in competition, they are making a war, so every concept of ecology is a form of uh, reali realization of the fact that there is society among non-human. So this is extremely important. This is an insight that we have to keep. The other point which is extremely important in ecology is the fact that ecology is, uh, in a way, the mass universalist and the mass universal science. We developed, we in the sense of <laughs> human species, in a way, and we can develop because, in a way, there is nothing more, at least on Earth, than the relationship of all species and the relationship of these all species with all the species of the world. So, and this universalism is important. Sorry, I'm uh, sorry. I hope I can. It's not a problem for you. If I, uh, uh, this universalism is important because uh, also, f especially from a political point of view. So ecology today, in a way, uh, represent the only issue that can speak from a universalist point of view without the risk that someone is accusing you to take in the part of someone else. That's why, well, I, I say it with a joke, but that's why nobody can think that Greta Thunberg is speaking from the point of view of a Swedish heterosexual or homosexual or something cultural. It's like whenever you speak from the point of view of Earth, you're putting yourself before every kind of gender cultural uh, uh, difference. And this is extremely uh, important. And it's important also, and this is also in a way a consequence of the, of the uh, way how ecology was born. But, and here I will start with a couple of criticism uh, about ecology. The problem of ecology is, uh, or ecology that leads to uh, uh, or uh, more, but let's say uh, one or two uh, dark sides. First of all, it's the fact that ecology is obsessed with the family model, with the bourgeois model. So e starting from the name, as you know, ecology comes from the Greek uh, term uh, eco e economy, which means the order of the family, the domestic order. Uh, uh, and the second point is the obsession for balance. In a way, every time that we're speaking about ecology, we are thinking that everything in nature finds automatically a balance. So in a way, I don't know what, how it is the debate here in, in Japan, but in Europe, uh, if you are reading, I'm not speaking now, uh, I'm not just speaking or not really of the uh, academic debate, but if you are taking even if it's the same, because this, the concept of ecosystem is a concept of automatic balance. But if you're taking a, a, a journal, a newspaper, the main idea is that if human being would stop to be human being, everything would be fine, and there would be nowhere any crisis, which is a lie, because, I mean, it's like nothing, it's in balance in nature. So. Uh, uh, and why it is a problem? First of all, the, the, this obsession for family, this obsession for houses uh, is a problem uh, because, because of, its, of, of the power of its metaphor, of the fact that we are speaking about the earth even, uh, always in the term of a big house, a big home, a big family, we, without realizing it, we transform nature into a sort of place of eternal lockdown. We just spent two years locked in our home, uh, and we realize how horrible it is not to have a space outside the home. Uh, why should we project on nature the idea that everybody is at home? It's not funny at all, in a way, not really. So, so uh, uh, and because of this kind, and the other problem is balance and uh, like peace, uh, uh, it's a problem because it, uh, it, there, there is the risk to transform nature into something which is more cl or closer to a sort of advertising. I don't know if you know this uh, 
very Really? Can you? Yeah, not really. So, uh, why then ecology is so bourgeois? It's so like uh, uh, familistic and so obsessed with uh, uh, with uh, with um, um, uh, balance. So the reason is the is an historical one. Uh, actually, scientific ecology. So this science, the question. I mean, under ecology, I'm not meaning the fact that we are respecting nature. This is not ecology. Ecology is the science or the knowledge about the relationship among all species in the world. And uh, uh, the relationship um, uh, between all the species and all the spaces of the Earth. So, it, and this, uh, this kind of questions uh, didn't exist before the 18th century. Why? Because it's a question, it's a set of questions that in a way presupposes a culture an imperialistic culture, a culture that uh, think to have seen everything in the world, uh, and a culture which, in a way, thinks to uh, grasp uh, the totality of species in the world. That's why the very uh, beginning of ecology is uh, in the, or ecology was uh, founded by the students of Carl Linné, Kalini is like the founder of modern systematic, so the one who realized the logical relationship among all species, and he invented a binomial system of classification of every single uh, species. And, oh, something happened. Uh, and uh, so, and the students by, of Linneo realize, as I say, that there is a social relationship among all species. Uh, but in order to, in a way, to prove it, it was a time uh, when uh, scientists didn't discover or didn't believe into the genealogical relationship among all species. It was before Darwin, before the birth of the evolutionary theory. In this, mom, in this uh, context, uh, in order to assume that there is a relationship between a mosquito in Tokyo, a kangaroo in Sydney, and a cow in Paris, uh, since they will never met them, each other, they do not have uh, like a, 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 a genealogical relationship. They are not alive. So you have to put yourself from the point of view of the one who created them, which is the Christian God. God created everything, so he had in mind the relationship between the cow in Paris, the mosquito in, uh, uh, in Tokyo, and the kangaroo in Sydney. The problem is, and that's why in a way, since the beginning, ecology needs a theological paradigm in order to, to, uh, to get this kind of universal uh, gaze. But the problem is that, uh, as you know, uh, Christianity thinks of uh, uh, the word as something created by this person, which is actually a male, so which means that everything on earth looks from the point of view of this human male person, everything in the world looks like a huge family uh, in front of its big father. That's why the, fir the, the very first name of this science was economy of nature. Economy is here in the Greek sense of the word, which means just the order of the house. 
So in order to grasp the, the ecology, so the relationship of all species and the, all species and the, uh, the, the earth, uh, you developed this science of the house, which is the science of the father of God. So that's why economy. Hmm? Uh, 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 the 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 sign. So the name of the science was changed in, in uh, 1866 by this uh, fa very famous. Uh, uh, um, sorry, I cannot speak. Uh, I have to. This very famous uh, 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 German uh, Darwin, uh, Darwinist uh, who changed economy in ecology. Why? Because at this time, uh, the word economy was still linked with the political economy, with the like commercial, uh, with the science of uh, of uh, of uh, 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 commodities. And this is also the second problem of ecology: the fact that actually. Uh, despite our hopes, despite every attempt to think of the actual academic form of ecology as an alternative to capitalism, actually ecology and political economies are two Siamese twins. They are signs that uh, share actually the name, the epistemological uh, frameworks, so the concepts, the metaphors, for instance, you do know, you do know probably that the, one of the leading metaphors in Adam Smith, the founder of a, a, a capitalistic economy, was the idea of an invisible hand, which is like producing order. This metaphor could be find, can be found also in the very first ecological treatises. So uh, uh, that's, that's the second problem. They share this kind of view on Earth of a domestic order. And what is interesting is also when you're looking, when you're reading the very first treatises on ecology, the biologists are saying uh, there is an order in nature exactly like the order in the market. So, uh, uh, this, the, the other part, part, uh, problem, as I, as I told, is, the, is like the, the obsession for balance. Uh, and this obsession for balance is even uh, in, in way testified or, or witnessed by the very central comp concept of ecology, which, this, which, which is the concept of ecosystem, which was invented in, two, in 1935 by, uh, by this uh, unknown, uh, at least for non-ecologists, uh, uh, um, uh, scientist, which is Arthur Tansley, British scientist, uh, who actually uh, which, uh, uh, um, invented this term in order to describe the fact that there is an automatic production of balance uh, among living beings and non or abiotic factors. Uh, I will uh, I will uh, skip a couple of uh, of uh, slides because I uh, spoke already too much. But uh, the, what I would like to propose is to, in a way, to uh, uh, to get out from this paradigm, which literally means to get out of our homes. Let's try to look at nature as something where there are no homes, no houses, and everybody can move whenever and wherever he, she, uh, they want. So that's the point. What does mean to think of the life of every species and the life of species on, in the space without having this obsession for balance and for houses. What does it mean to get out from the lockdown? Not just for us, for the, but for, uh, in a way for the Earth itself. Uh, and in order to get or the answer is a very simple one. It's the idea that uh, the relationship among species, it's an artistic one. It's an active, creative one. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that what we used to consider as a form of sociality is actually a form of mutual design. I would like to uh, prove you that, in a way, everything in nature is designed by something, and everything is designing everything else. Everything is chiseling, uh, modifying, uh, building what itself and what it surrounds itself, but on an aesthetic basis. So that's why, in a way, art should be the general science among life science, uh, life forms. Uh, 
so I hope it is clear. Uh, uh, so let's start from the, I would proceed in three steps. First of all, I would try to show you that in a way every space, uh, so matter extension is always fabricated, is always produced, is artificial. Uh, the very first uh, point we have to assume is that there is nothing natural in nature. Everything is produced, everything is created, everything is artificial. In order to do that, we have to get rid for, of this theological image of the planet. You know this uh, picture is the very first picture taken of Earth in the last Apollo mission. It's the very first uh, picture of the totality of Earth uh, uh, illuminated by the sun in December uh, 19, uh, 1972. And we, uh, this picture, uh, in a way, has two problems. First of all, it uh, communicates the idea of perfection. Uh, and then it communicates the idea of a planet which would be naturally destined or doomed to host life. Both presuppositions are false. First of all, the Earth was not there in order to host life. And the, so the nature of Earth is not to host life. And, and the proof of that is when you're looking to the beginning of the, of the story of the planet, you realize that at the beginning it was just a ball of, of fire. It was totally unlivable. And this planet has been made livable by the living being itself. So it's not that the, the Earth is something which is like naturally there in order to host life. No, the living being is a strange paradox. We will see wh wh how it happened, but the, uh, the, the living beings themselves modified, designed the planet in order to allow themselves to live there. This is the very first point. So in, from this point of view, the, plant, the Earth itself uh, is an artifact which is even more artificial than this telephone. Why more artificial? Because this telephone, this smartphone is like produced by just by one species. The Earth is produced by a huge amount of species, like billions of species during billions of years, uh, which makes, in a way, this fact makes the vulnerability of the Earth. Because as you know, everything which is artificial is vulnerable, is breakable, and something which has been made by a lot of species is even more breakable than something which has been made by one species. Why? Because if most of the species of the Earth are no more there, so that's why so it's difficult to, to, to produce or to keep the balance. The second point is that the, the planet Earth is not perfect at all. We, it's not a sphere. So a more precise uh, image of the Earth is this, what is called GI, that's the picture of the Earth uh, produced by calculating the force of gravity. And uh, this is another picture. So, in a way, if you're looking at the Earth in its eyes, uh, it's really ugly or differently beautiful. So it's it's not a very very beautiful uh, planet. Why I'm stressing that? It's not in order to insult our planet. Uh, it's just in order to show that it's because it's not perfect. Uh, that I mean, it was never so. Be uh, it was not. It's not that it was so beautiful and we destroyed. Uh, a beauty, the planet was all, always a little bit ugly, and the living beings tried to make it better or to uh, uh, make it up in a way. Hmm? Uh, the second point uh, about, uh, uh, in order to realize that uh, uh, our everything is produced, everything is artificial, is to look back to the uh, very history of the concept of environment. Do you, you know that the very first biologist uh, who uh, actually realized that everything that surrounds uh, uh, the living being as an agency, as something which has to be taken into account by biology, was this French biologist called uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who is one of the very first to use the, ver the, the word biology, uh, and Lamarck named the reality around the living being with a French word which is milieu, which means literally not 
environment which is surrounding, but it means literally what is uh, within something or what is in between something. Why? Because actually, milieu was uh, 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 the, um, the translation of uh, a technical word from the theory of magnetism. You know, the theory of magnetism has been in the history of science uh, 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 the, 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 a place of uh, a lot of problems. Why? Because just think of a magnet that you put on your fridge. You have a cause uh, which is able to exercise a power on a, on a body which is distant. So you have an event without a contact. And that was difficult to explain this action and distance. Uh, and normally, uh, the physics b before the, the 20th century was uh, accustomed to explain this power, this transmission of power from the, from the cause to the effect, from the magnet to the fridge, with the idea that there is an intermediary space, called in Latin medium, an in-between body, which is able to convey the force from the cause, from the magnet, to the fridge to the effect. So naming the environment, milieu, medium, intermediary space, uh, Lamarck was or wanted to say that the environment is space in as much as able to convey force. That in front of life, there is nothing, there is not something like, like space, there is just force. Life is something which has to, in a way, relate to what is surrounding it as a force in the double sense. Why? Because Lamarck was the very first to, to uh, realize that the environment is exercising uh, power on, on us, is modifying us, the environment is modifying the anatomical form of the living beings. You always, you, uh, you all know the examples of uh, of the ducks and so on. So the, the environment is really chiseling the anatomical uh, body of the living beings. But what is interesting for us is the fact that actually uh, um, in 1802, uh, uh, he published a book on hydrogeological researches uh, where he asked himself this extremely interesting question. What is the influence of living bodies on materials which are on the surface of Earth and which compose the crust with which it is everywhere covered? And what are the general results of this influence? So the idea is to reverse the influence. The environment is influencing us, but what's our influence? Our, in the sense, the influence of living being on Earth. And the answer of Lamarck was amazing because the answer was actually there is no single spot on Earth which has not been modified, chiseled, uh, transformed, redesigned by a living being, or it is the corpse of ancient living beings. So the Earth, the environment, is not just influenced by living beings. It's like a product, a byproduct of living being, or it's the ancient body of living beings. So everything, again, is artificial. And what is interesting is that um, this uh, uh, insight has been, in a way, it's simply to say confirmed, because uh, it's not a confirmation, but it, it has been, let's say, deepened by uh, geological insights by this, uh, uh, among others, by this uh, geologist who is teaching in the States, who uh, published a paper in 2008 uh, called Mineral Evolution. And the paper is amazing because uh, Hazen asked himself, why are there on Earth more mineral mineralogical species than on other planets? So why are there so many species forms of uh, stones on Earth than on Venus or on Mars? And the difference is not uh, just a little difference, it's like three to one. So. And the answer was because of the presence of living beings. So the answer is uh, a quite uh, complex chemical answers. So I, I will skip on that. But the, the point is that there is a lot of oxidation processes on the Earth which are triggered by the presence of living beings. And that's why uh, so the 
let's say the mineral crust of the earth has been modified so strongly, which is interesting again, because that means that the presence of living beings on earth has modified the mineral flesh of this planet. So in a certain point, or from a certain point of view, the life, it's the cancer of this planet. In the sense that it, it is not, it, the, it, it's not that life is just uh, modifying the skyline of this planet. It is modifying really the body, the flesh, the organs of the planet. So that's why we should start to understand it, to realize that the Earth is an artifact. Then what we call landscape, it's actually a collection or an army of landscaper architects. Uh, and in a way, or with, with another image, we could say that the world is a garden, but the living beings are not the content of those gardens. They are the garden themselves. Uh, another point, which another concept which, which is interesting, is the fact that uh, the origin of Earth is within the Earth itself, uh, and every species, every living being, is a sort of big bang within the Earth. That's the first part, the first step. That, now let's uh, uh, take the second step. Yeah, we have time. So, um, so which is, uh, we saw that everything is artificial, everything is produced, everything is designed. Now let's focus on this agency of the living being. Why and under which form every living being is an agent in the double sense of doing something and doing something consciously. Why to be alive means to be active and conscious. In order to uh, uh, go faster, because I cannot do the, like, the proof of every single species on Earth, it would take a lot. Let's take also in honor to Stefano, which is uh, who is uh, Stefano Mancuso is uh, today absent, uh, but who contributed a lot to, to this kind of uh, new approach. Uh, um, let's take the example of uh, plants. Why? Because plants were, in for a lot of decades, for a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, centuries, the example of non-active, non-conscious living beings, of stuff th which is just there. You, at least in Europe, I don't know in Japan, but nobody thinks, just take, uh, make this ex experiment in your mind. Uh, if you were, I don't know, strolling in Paris in a boulevard with 50 lions, uh, you would have the impression, the feeling of being in an animated space. If you are strolling in a boulevard with 50 oaks, uh, nobody would think there is people there out there. So that's, that's the very uh, evidence of the fact that plants were never been and were never been considered, have never been considered as uh, active. But plants are act extremely active. First of all, as you know, they redesign the atmosphere. The oxygen you, you can breathe is like produced by, pl by plants. And they are artificial also in a very different way. They catch for the very same uh, process, the photosynthesis. They catch the light, which is the most important source of energy on Earth, and they insufflate it into this mineral stone of the Earth, which is amazing for two reasons. First of all, because we do not realize by the light is extraterrestrial, which means that we are aliens. We are a little bit extraterrestrial. So you are made out of terrestrial elements, but the fact that you can hear me the fact that you can be alive, it's actually made possible by extraterrestrial energy, which is amazing in a way. And the plants are in a way extraterrestrializing, alienizing the earth. And the second point which is interesting is the fact that uh, in a way every time that you are eating, you are searching for this sunlight. So from this point of view, now I'm making an Italian point, or now I'm revealing you that I'm Italian. Eating is the most spiritual activity in the world because you are searching for light. So, and eating, it, the nutrition is this kind of trade of light which passes from body to body, from species to species, to species, from kingdom to kingdom. 
it, the agency of plants is not just an active, a physical one. They are uh, uh, consciously there. And this is what Stefano Mancuso and other botanists like uh, Francisek Baluska, Anthony Trewavas in other parts of the world uh, proved. Actually, uh, the modern botany proved that plants are conscious of what is happening, or plants are aware. They know what, ha what is happening outside them. They know what is happening inside them. And they know the difference between the outside and the outside, which is a very technical definition of consciousness. So plants are self-conscious, which is uh, huge as, uh, uh, as a, can I, how can I say, as a, as a, um, as a scientific truth. Uh, first of all, because, uh, yeah, you have to realize that they are conscious species. So you have to, when you're strolling in Paris, you have to perhaps to give them names uh, or to treat them as uh, exactly like you treat your cat or your, uh, or your uh, dog. But it's amazing because, uh, and it's revolutionary, because through this uh, uh, discovery, we realized that the idea that you need a, a brain or a nervous system in order to have consciousness or have thinking, it's not a scientific evidence. It's just the result of a bias. So we never ever asked plants to show us what does it mean to be intelligent. We always made experiments with human beings or with mice, with rats, with cats. So we never put ourselves in front of, of an oak or a jinko and asked to this jinko Show me what does it mean to be intelligent, and in a way, uh, 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 in a way, the fact that the plants do not have uh, a nervous system is a sign of their intelligence. Why? Because to be a plant, to be a tree, means that you are where you are there for like, let's say, four centuries, and if you take or if you take the same way that animals uh, took. Uh, to, to build a brain, to build a, a, a nervous system, which means to focus, to concentrate the organs which are supposed to give you intelligence on a single spot, you will die. Why? Let's take another example. Uh, we are focusing our relationship with the sun in those two very tiny holes. And everything depends from the from these very tiny holes, and why we can focus uh, this so important activity on these uh, uh, very tiny holes? Because we can fly away, we can escape, we can move. Plants cannot move, and if you cannot move, uh, you cannot focus. Uh, it's so, such an important activity on a, such a, a little spot. You have to diffuse or to multiply the place of your body when you are where you are exercising this activity. So are making plants through leaves. So leaves are like eyes. They are more like lights be eyes because uh, for plants, uh, the sunlight, it's, it's not just optical. It's like a, a sort of a mixture between uh, energy, electrical energy and milk. So, but they are producing thousands of them just because if they are losing one, it's not a problem. So from this point of view, uh, uh, biologists today are more and more approaching to what uh, Umberto Maturana, who is, uh, used to be a Chilean uh, uh, scientist, uh, who uh, made the point that we should think of intelligence and of uh, consciousness as synonym of life, exactly like we should, we normally think of Reproduction as a synonym for life. Every time that I'm, uh, uh, that you are thinking of uh, a living being, you're not asking yourself, is it able to reproduce itself or not? You are asking yourself, through which devices is this living being able to reproduce itself? The same should be for intelligence. You should never ask yourself, is this living being intelligent or not? You should ask yourself how, through which devices, through which anatomical and physical and physiological process uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, living being is able to reproduce itself. Uh, yeah, I will skip a couple of uh, trees are also extremely uh, uh, 
active and they are artistic uh, in a way agents in the sense that for instance to be a tree means to be multi to be a tree means to be a tree means to have uh, to add a part of your body each spring uh, so which means that first of all you would have a multi-aged body it's like it's as if uh, my nose would have two ears my arm two centuries and so on it's interesting. And the second point is that you have to be focused or to be obsessed by your form, by the shape you gave. So in the way to be a tree means to also to have this kind of uh, self-shaping agency. And there is a lot of research on that. I, will, I had to skip, otherwise uh, I, uh, uh, I will uh, uh, miss the, the final point. Uh, just uh, 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 in order to finish the second step, why, ev why we, sh we should consider Evelyn being as an agent in the double sense of to be active and to be conscious because of birth? It's a very simple question, but it's not simple at all. Why? Because birth is like a black hole, not just in biology, but also in our culture. Our culture is a sexist one. It's, it is produced by male for males, by people who are not able to give birth to anything. But birth is actually the muscle. The, 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 it's not my judgment. If you are, if I'm asking you, give me a couple of, uh, give me titles or books or uh, films about death. You will uh, give me like uh, thousands of titles about birth. There are just just a couple of titles. So in uh, in uh, in uh, in Japan, because of uh, Naomi Kawase, perhaps it's uh, more easier. But uh, it's not so simple to find even biological uh, treatises on the fact of birth, but still, birth is the most universal phenomenon in life. Uh, so every living being has to be born in order to be. And that's why in Latin languages, the word nature is the same word for being born. To be part of nature means to be obliged to be born in order to be alive. And what does it mean to be born? It means that in order to exist, uh, each of us and each of them, uh, they have to take already living matter. So to be born is that everybody has taken, has stolen DNA, body, blood, breath, from someone who was already there. So from this point of view, every living being is recycling a life which was already there, which is amazing if you think about that. First of all, because it, because it proves you why everything has to be active, because everybody, every living being has to modify itself in order to affirm itself because of birth. So we have stolen everything from our parents. We have to do something, otherwise we are not ourselves. But it's amazing as a phenomenon because that means that the life which is inside your body, it's older than your body. I make you an example. I'm 46, but since my mother, since I was born and my mother was 30 when I was born, that means that the life I took from her, the life which has passed without interruption from her body to my body, has now 76 years old. But since my mother was also born, so my, the life who is speaking to you through my body is even older, and older as the humanity itself. But since the first Eve, the first woman who uh, was born, was also born by another primate, by another species, that means that the life you have in your body is as old as life itself, which is amazing because it's like the fact of birth, the fact that there cannot be any interruption uh, among living beings, that, sh that, should, that there should be a continuity among every living being, that means that you are as old as life itself, that you are perhaps 30, 40, 70, but the life which is in your body has three billions of years. And it's the same life of uh, the first living being who has, in a way, modified generation after generation its appearance in order to stay there. Uh, uh, 
And the, the second point, which is important uh, also in order to, uh, and the last point for this second step, in order to understand uh, uh, the paradox of life, and also in order to understand why we are always chiseling, modifying, uh, transforming ourselves, is the fact, because of this continuity of every living being, uh, among the same species, but also among other species, we are all patchwork. There is no purity in life. I mean, I am a patchwork between my parents, which is a disaster because my parents uh, didn't get along together in their life, and I transformed to my through my body my parents into Siamese twins. That's why life is so difficult. So I put in an atomical unity people who couldn't, I mean, couldn't get together. So, but the, on a on a more general level, in a way. Uh, uh, Every species is a patchwork of different species. We, so we see it through mapping of DNA, but every time that you're looking at the mirror, you see two eyes, a nose, two, uh, two ears, and a mouth, and all those features, you share them with a huge amount of other species, uh, which means that your body is giving you access to a multi-species multi experience that we are a walking zoo, so we are, in a way, already biodiverse. You don't need to put yourself in, in front of uh, a cat in order to make experience of biodiversity. You are already biodiverse in yourself. Now, the last point. Uh, so every species is, uh, uh, is actually just 10 minutes. Give me 10 minutes and uh, I'm, yeah, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, I'm ready. So. Uh, the last point is that Every species is designing itself and the other species. Let's take the uh, first point. Every species is like designing uh, itself. Uh, this point was actually already proved or uh, showed by Darwin. We normally uh, associate Darwin with the idea of natural selection, which was the content of the publication of 1859, the original species. There. Darwin proposed the idea that there is a sort of product, natural production of variety in nature, of variety of individual forms. And then there is a force, which is natural selection, which filters, which selects the fittest one. So this is what you learned also at school, which is a very specific idea because it means that uh, evolution is not in the end of the living beings. It's something that living beings are passively accepting from the outside. But 12 years later, Darwin published this book when, where he proposed a new theory called sexual selection because he realized that there are a lot of cases where you cannot explain the, the evolution, the production of forms in nature with the paradigm of natural selection, with this idea that of spontaneous production of variety and then someone who is filtering the best, the fittest one. The typical example of this case is the peacock. Why? First of all, because to be a peacock uh, doesn't mean to be the fittest individual. To be, a key, to be a male peacock means to have a huge tail that you are showing to your partner in order to convince her to make love with you. So and, and you cannot fly. You have this huge tail with you, so you are not fit at all, <laughs> first. Secondly, in order to prove that these forms are produced in an evolutionary way, so continually and gradually, you have to suppose that someone saw them and someone chose every time the most beautiful one, which is the opposite of of the natural selection, so which is the idea that uh, uh, someone has to be a living being, uh, so in this case the female, uh, so this, wo this work was shocking uh, the 19th century Europe because it gave uh, to, the f to the woman uh, the power of deciding where the species is going. So someone has to see and someone has the power to decide where to go and the base of the judgment uh, is not uh, an utilitarian one, is an aesthetical one, which was huge because if we are taking seriously this idea, that means that 
the species of the peacock is an artistic product, is an artwork produced by the female, which means that the males are just the performers and the female are uh, in a way just, uh, are, are just uh, the, 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 the um, curator. So Yuko <laughs> is like uh, deciding the destiny of humanity, and we are just uh, we are just performing her decisions. Uh, uh, and uh, these ideas were confirmed also, or they are t t t taken uh, uh, again by uh, another biologist uh, uh, recently. Richard Prime is the biology we teach uh, the, in the ornithologist we teach uh, teaching at uh, Yale University. I'm skipping because uh, we do not have time. But you you understood the point. So every species is producing itself. So it's an active design, an active designer of itself. And the principle of producing uh, this design is not an utilitarian one. It's an aesthetical one. The second point is actually, I would love to to, to prove yourself in let's take just five minutes that this large, this aesthetical logic of design of constructing of the form of the life exists also in the relationship among species. So it's not just in the self relationship of a species to itself. It's it's the relationship of all species altogether. In order to prove that, just take a very, very common example, I skip a lot of pages, a very common example of uh, the flowers. So flowers, as you know, are sexual organs, which this fact leads every botanist to make every time this very stupid joke, which is every time that you offer a bunch of flowers to someone, please remember that you are offering a bunch of dick and vaginas to someone. <laughs> so a bunch, of, it's the same as if you would offer a, uh, a bunch of sexual organs of a cat, which is disgusting. <laughs> Instead of that, each time that we receive flowers, we say, oh, how beautiful, <laughs> which is a very strange uh, <laughs> attitude. But flowers are strange also for another reason. Uh, because they are uh, ephemeral sexual organs. So they are built every year, So, which is as if we should build our sexual organs every year. Uh, and in a sense, a tree is building like um, hundreds of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, sexual organs every year, which means that it's quite beautiful to be a tree, especially in the spring. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, the final point uh, of uh, why, why flowers are so paradoxical, it's because they are actually normally, in most cases, they are um, uh, hermaphrodite, so they contain the feminine and the masculine part. But, and that's the point, uh, nature impedes self-fertilization. So it's not possible to just fertilize yourself. That's why plants need pollination. They need insects, they need uh, wind, they need uh, water. They need someone who brings the masculine part to the feminine part, which produces a lot of paradoxes. First of all, it makes of the sex of plants a sort of multi-specific orgy. So imagine that you have to imply in your sexual uh, uh, enterprises, an individual who is belonging not even to your species, it's belonging to another kingdom. Imagine that if I want to have sex with someone, I have to take my sperm and give it to I don't know, a fungi or a, uh, or a tree and tell him, do what, uh, whatever you do, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> make out something, <laughs> make something out of that. So it's like, it's a very strange, uh, I mean, sex, so sex has to be public. Uh, uh, the, but the, the, the most amazing point is that that means that the flower is not just uh, an instrument of communication among kingdom, which is amazing. So we cannot speak with our dog, plants manage to speak with insects, with birds. They are amazing. The second point is that flowers are also devices that put the biological and genetical destiny of a species in the hands of another individual, individual which is belonging to another kingdom. 
That means that flowers are, in a way, a huge device of trust. So it is as if, really, I would tell to a, uh, to a Jinko, you decide the destiny of my family, which is huge. So every plant is doing that. Yeah, yeah, I'm finishing. Thank you. Uh, uh, but the most important point to our, uh, to our scope is the fact that the bee, let's take the bee as a, a, a pollinator. The bee is deciding who is mating with whom uh, just out of aesthetical criteria, just again on the base of a taste judgment. He is visiting another flower because of the form, because of the scent of sugar, so because of something which is sensory. As you said, everything is sensory, it's not, not utilitarian, it's not a lack of reason. So, that means that if we are taking seriously those both conclusions, uh, that means that every time that you are in nature, that you are visiting a forest, uh, you should not think of forest as something which is like an ecosystem, so something where every species is there in order to find a balance. No, every species is there in order to produce some new form out of itself and out of the other. So in a way, what we used to call ecosystem, our ecosystems are in a way museum for contemporary nature. So, or what we call what we could call contemporary nature. So spaces where, exactly like in these museums, it's like exactly like in the exhibition uh, made by Yuko, in a way, uh, uh, everybody is trying to invent a new destiny for all the species which are implied. Thank you so much. Professor Kocha, thank you very much. And I think your world has probably changed from 70 minutes ago, and it's very important. When I first heard from Professor Kocha, my view of the world changed greatly as well. So philosophers, regarding how we view the world, that's what they talk about. And by talking about, to talk about how to view the world, they use a variety of intelligence. And it's the same with art. So this kind of thing, this time. So why is it PS, why is this PS1 and not the 21st Century Museum? I felt a little lonely about that, but, but we need to constantly update and come up with something new. So that's why he is saying PS1, maybe. That's what I felt. And Sejima-san, yes, please talk about this later. So, that was a wonderful keynote. And we'd like to ask for feedback from each of the panelists after this. But we need to redo the stage. So let's take a five-minute break. And thank you very much, Professor Kocha. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you are back at your seat. And we now begin the second session of the symposium. So this time, as we said earlier, we are joined by the co-curators, Professor Shinohara from Kyoto University. And at Kyoto University, he is a specific associate professor at Kyoto University's Graduate School of Comprehensive Arts and his main areas of interest are contemporary philosophy, environmental humanities, architecture, and contemporary art. And he worked together with Rinko Kawauchi. And in Venice Biennale, he also collaborated with her. He has experienced curation. And his major publications include The Ecology of Multiple Lives, The Philosophy of the Anthropocene, and The Philosophy of After Humanity. His main translations include Ecology Without Nature by Timothy Morton. We have Professor Ishikura, uh, anthropologist and associate professor of Department of Arts and Roots, Akita Public Art University. He has done various field research and he had conducted comparative mythology and artistic anthropology 
anthropological research on images of non-human species in the Pacific Rim. He has also worked in collaboration with artists and musicians in 2019. He will participate in the Japanese pavilion exhibition Cosmo X Cosmic X at the 58th Venice Biennale. And we are also joined by Spatniko. She is an associate professor at the Department of Design, Faculty of Fine Arts, Tokyo National University of Fine Arts and Music. Recent major exhibitions include the Detour 2021 Design Festival, and she is also quite interested and critically interested in these spaces and information. And she has also created works that would invite in uh, questions from the audience. She's gone to the um, Milan Biennale as well and the Modi Museum. So we are joined by the members who are creative and critical. So we will have discussion with them today. So now, Professor Koche, you went to the exhibition. So first we will ask Professor Koche on his feedback and impression of the exhibition. Hi, hi, Emmanuel. Hi, what to do? I'm asking you. No, 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 sorry. sorry. Uh, so, uh, how, how long should it be? Five minutes. Five sorry. minutes, okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, no, because, yeah. Yeah, so I would say, I had to say at the beginning of my talk, um, I was extremely impressed by, by uh, Art Fresh, on, uh, I would say in, in French, so the freshness of the proposal, uh, uh, of the curatorial proposal. Uh, first of all, the, I must say the, the, the fact that you avoided to take uh, old parts, old artists, uh, old artists in the sense artists known uh, uh, by everyone, which is the case of almost every single exhibition uh, in Europe about ecology, which is becoming like the extreme, the must uh, come, every single art center in Europe is now doing uh, 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 exhibitions on ecology, but showing the same artists with the same Joe and so on. So this is, uh, it was uh, shock, not shocking, in the positive sense of the word, the, the, the fact that uh, I discovered a lot of works that I didn't know. Uh, and then uh, uh, what is interesting, it's two aspects from a speculative point of view. First of all, we were speaking about that, uh, the very different, I would say it's not, I, I, I was saying uh, the lack of the apocalyptic uh, perspective, but it's more than that because it's not, uh, it's, like, it's the fact that perhaps this, the culture of this uh, country, I'm now saying a lot of platitudes, but uh, 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 has passed through a lot of apocalypses and uh, artists here, know that the uh, apocalypse is not the end, it's like just, uh, just uh, a metamorphosis. And this is, this is why perhaps it's so refreshing, because there is no tragical at all, uh, tragical pathos uh, in all those works. And this is perhaps the most important point, there is, because of that, there is no um, preach about guilty, which is the most common point in ecological art in Europe and in the States. So every time that an artist is approaching this theme, the question is not, is no more in a way the natural question how to live together. The question is, is not the variety of species. So the question becomes immediately the question of guilt. So, which is the 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 master, uh, how can I say, the biggest mistake we could do in treating these uh, problems. Uh, first of all, because we are not doing ecology anymore, we are doing moral theology. Uh, uh, we are transforming a practical and a political uh, question into something that has to do with, like, yeah, the judgment about the uh, the the. The, I don't know, the, some people in the past. Uh, and secondly, because this kind of uh, uh, artworks or discourses in uh, Europe 
leads to a very strange form of theology in the sense that they, the, the, the dialectics that comes out from this work are the following one. So the human being is uh, the most horrible, the most violent, the most uh, dangerous species in the world, uh, which is a theological statement. Uh, first of all, because it's exactly the same statement that has been uh, stated in, the, in Europe uh, through Christianity, which was uh, humanity is the crown of creation, so it's the most perfect uh, species. Now they, just, they have just changed the sign, so they just think that humanity is the, is the best, but in the worst. So it's like, you know, this kind of form of negative narcissism, people who are obsessed by themselves, but they don't like themselves. So. It's it's not it's not a, a huge progress so in a way so and also it's theological also from for another reason it's theological because uh, this way you transform humanity in something which is able to destroy nature so in something which is godlike it's like a sort of a gnostic uh, divinity which is produced by nature but which is able to destroy itself so that's that's uh, that's the problem. Uh, and this kind of tragic or theological pathos uh, is totally absent here. And what is interesting and what is uh, for me extremely important, because it was in a way also the point of, the, of, of my talk, uh, it's the fact that uh, in a lot of, uh, in a lot of, uh, of the works, in most works, uh, there is really no distinction between technology and nature. So it's like uh, I think of... Uh, of course, the video, your video, but also your video, and a lot of it. So nature is not something which is opposed to technology or the other way around. So nature is the space where every technology is, in a way, renewing itself uh, all the time. It, it, it has reminded me to something uh, which... Uh, so it's, so it's, it, this is, for me, the, like the, the, the point. The point, not just in an artistic, uh, from an artistic point of view, it's really the perspective we have to, to develop. And just in order to understand why, uh, I would just tell you uh, a story. So there is a, a, a German philosopher of the last century who went to, uh, whose name was Alfred Sonretel. He went to Neapel to visit in the 30s, like every German philosopher at the time. And he wrote a text about uh, technology uh, in Neapel, and he says, in Neapel, things start to work when they are broken. So because Neapolitana find always the way to, uh, and in a way, the, what I learned from this exhibition, that nature is exactly that, is a space where things start to work when they are broken. Thank you. So each of the panelists were involved in the, in the exhibition and Professor Shinohara. So what Professor Kocha just said, it was very impressive, but regarding this exhibition, Professor Shinohara, you collaborated as an artist. So could you please let us know your thoughts, what it was like? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, first, I'd like to start in Japanese. And Professor Kocha, uh, his words were very inspiring and very interesting. In particular, nature is like a space where there's a lot of creativity. And the way he grasped the situation was very interesting. And it was quite close to what I think as well. And how should I put this? There are, as a something you can control, looking at nature as something controllable. In Japan too, the modernity principles after modernism, then came the Industrial Revolution. So suppressing nature, that kind of thing, a regime like this exists. And how do you overcome the limits? Probably this time, as I was involved in the exhibit, that's what I was thinking about. 
and Ms. Kawauchi Rinko. Her photographs were on show, and the biggest issue was first. Personally, I study philosophy as well, and the human condition, the conditions of being human. I've been thinking about this, and this question is, so what makes us human? That's the question. And when thinking about this, when you talk about the human condition, Han Ardent, Arendt, um, Walter Benjamin and Deleuze, similar generations, so a lot of you probably read them, and Nishida Kitaro, Japanese philosopher, Tosaka Jun, that belonged to the Kyoto School. I've been reading their works as I was thinking about the human condition. And the issue was, like you said, space. So a variety of things coexist together. So what's the common dimension in which humans coexist? And I think probably that's what the professor was thinking about as well. And regarding this, I had to change my way of thinking with the East Japan earthquake in the year 2011. In Japan, there was a major earthquake which caused a lot of damage. So this was a crisis, a natural disaster, which means that the human condition can break down very easily. That's what we all experienced in the earthquake. So when you think about the significance, the human condition is not stable, it's unstable. And it can be groundless. And regarding this, we had to think about this. So the houses that are standing there, Professor Kocha talked about ecology and homes or families and balance and stable. And so you can grasp ecology. And he said, let's stop looking at ecology through these analogies. And I agree with him. So the house can break down or collapse in a natural disaster. And that's something we have to think about. Therefore, Professor Kocha, he may talk about this later, but in this new book, the world is not fragile. Earth is not fragile. So what is fragile? It's the human world that's fragile, not the earth. So in the human world, the fragility, I think that's what we were thinking about. But what started us thinking about this was uh, Rinko Kawaguchi's photographs. And you can see the photographs of the exhibit. And personally, I was really inspired. Uh, so there's the a collection of light and shadow. And it's, the photo collection has been translated into English as well. So there are things that are destroyed easily, the destruction aspect. And then there's the emptiness after the destruction. And she captured this in the world of photographs. And I thought she's a wonderful photographer. And I've known Kawaguchi-san for a long time. But once again, I was able to reconfirm how wonderful her photographs are. And it was the photographs after the earthquake that made me realize this. And this time, after COVID-19, there are the Guardia photographs, and we've put them on show. Her children, there's light shining down on her children. And in the daily world, so there's a crack running through our daily, ordinary world. And this is like a hidden realm. This is the moment that hidden realm was revealed. So the future in this photograph is being expressed. And with this guardian photograph, I was able to realize this. And it's an ecological crisis, but again, it makes you think about the future. And people who can take photographs like this are quite amazing. That's why we invited her to join us. And another thing, with the Guardian photograph, after discovering Kawaguchi-san, we've been contacting each other quite frequently. And as part of this process, Illuminance, there's a photo collection. And this time, from the Illuminance collection, uh, there are several that were on that are on show, and Illuminance is going to be published from a, a New York publisher as the tenth year edition, and she asked me to write a piece for this, and I did. And other than that, uh, we've been involved in a variety of other ways, 
and you can see her photographic and video works. So the photographs she's taken, and I have been offering comments on her works. So this is like our working together as a collaboration. And me too, I use words, but I've been inspired by her photographs, and my words have been drawn out thanks to her photographs. And then after that, after hearing my words, she chooses her photographs. So rather than a curator and a photographer, I get inspired by her photographs and I change the words that I use. I think that's the relationship that we have. Do I still have time? No? Uh? Mm? Maiko, sensei, o tsukai kudasai. Uh, yes, and after listening to Professor Kocha, there are a lot of other things that I thought of, so maybe I can talk about those later. Okay, thank you very much. So, the way we collaborate, so getting inspiration from the photographer, and then from that inspiration, um, so Kawachi-san has chosen other photographs, so that's a very interesting way of being involved. And next, Ishikura-san, please. Hi, thank you. Thank you, I'm Ishikura. First, Professor Koche, thank you very much for a very inspiring presentation, especially when I looked at the photo of a baby. Ten years ago, I had the first son, and my wife was very worried if she was able to give birth to a healthy baby. And as an, anthropo um, uh, as an anthologist, I said that uh, we have been doing this for two billion years, so it's okay. But then actually I was wrong. We actually have a history of thir three billion years. So I am reflecting on my mistake. So I thought that Adam Ben said that a human is different from other um, living beings, but then today, uh, as a Homo sapiens, we are trying to integrate our species, which means that we are not only looking at human beings, but we are thinking about how human beings can coexist with other species, and they are conducting field research. And human beings are not exceptional beings, but rather human beings are the same as other species designing their own species. So that is a new kind of biology. And as um, a student, when I was young, I, have, I was working with artists. And also in the traditional community, I looked at uh, the performing arts and festivals. And that's how I looked at the species. Currently, I live in the northern part of Japan called Tohoku, which has a lot of snow. And the general public create masks and other dolls and different kinds of items that express the culture. And I think that is not the, di any different from the works by modern artists. So even though they are conservative, they are trying to create new things. So they do have that kind of paradox. In that sense, I think that those people in Tohoku and modern artists are the same. So personally, I have been um, researching on mythology. So mythology is a story of others. and. Mythology is a metamorphosis of the a part of stories by others. So, Professor Kocha, you said that actually the species, the, the living beings have done the same. In the history of evolution, you have carried on the DNA information, and then we have passed down that information to the next generation. So the creative activities that human beings do and what is being done in the natural world are similar. And we can see the common elements in the two. So in the northern area of Japan, which has much snow, the old women take apart the cloth and make thread because the cotton was quite rare in the past. So they, the, they torn the cloth and created thread. 
And they have been continuing to use the threat for a century or two centuries. So this is indeed a matter of passing down something. And living beings are always connected to the former generations. And I think that's being done in Tohoku is quite similar to what you talked about. So can you talk about your contribution to the exhibition? Yes. So in this exhibition, how I was involved in the exhibition was that uh, I was uh, involved in the book creating project. And I was wondering how to contribute to this exhibition. And I wanted to write about uh, the stories of people in Tohoku. About 100 years ago, uh, Sugai Masumi, a traveler, was traveling from Aichi Prefecture and then to Tohoku. And uh, this person died in Akita Prefecture in Tohoku region. And he had a great drawing of trees. And Nagasaka Aki is the artist who focused on this drawing. Sugai Masumi went to this place in Tohoku. So Nagai-san decided to go to the same place to uh, make a painting in the same place. So this book has a similar theme to uh, Professor Kocha's book. So basically, uh, trees are visible above the soil, but not visible below the soil. And the trees are the media that connect the visible and the invisible parts. And I think that is quite connected or relevant to what Professor Kocha is saying. So uh, there is another story on island. Nagasaka-san went to a uh, field work in this island. And based on this experience, uh, this work was created. For example, what kind of plants were brought in by people and which plants are native to the island. And at one point in time, if the island is isolated by other uh, areas, then how can the island be self-sustenant? Uh, you can see the photos and the paintings. And Nagasaka-san is focusing on storytelling in this piece. And you can hear the storytelling by the island residents. And you can hear how the residents are making their own stories. So it's not just about the stories told by external parties, but the island residents themselves are talking about their own stories on the island. So I was quite impressed by this piece. And I looked at other pieces in the exhibition, and I thought that we can see how hope, how we can create the future with hope. So as Professor Ko just said, there's no the apocalypse the ap apocalyptic um, aspect. So it may be because uh, of the combination of the Shintoism and other religions in Japan, because a lot of new things are always created. So the concept of the end of something may be different here in Japan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Sputniko, you are a mother too, but this is a new work, yes. Last year in September, I had my first child. And uh, the professor's comments on birth were very interesting. And maybe I can touch on them later with the slides. And today, oh, when I talk about the exhibits, can I start with my second slide, please? Oh, please stop this for a moment. Yes, put that on hold. And the second slide, please. So before we play it, first regarding the exhibit. Today, I am the only one present here today as an artist, so maybe that's why I've been asked to make a comment, but this exhibit this time, there are diverse artists and their practical works and then their trial and error. And this too 
is common across the way I come up with my works, but ecology. What is ecology? And in ecology, what are the borderlines? Where are the borderlines? And you don't see the answers, but through your works, by actually doing it, you can move forward and feel your way forward. So this is how it feels like. So as I create my works, I can experience this and then show it to others. So that's what I've constantly been doing when I come up with my works. So making, looking, knowing, and the people who see my works regarding the feel, it's like everything is everywhere and they can feel it together with me. And then think about what is ecology. Think about it together with the artists. I think there's that aspect. And this exhibit this time, there was a lot of diverse execution, diverse feelings, diverse... It was very interesting. And I looked at everything. And other than the environmental ecology, there's the metaverse ecology as well. So what kind of works do I have on show this time? I'd like to show this and play this as I explain. So this time, targeting this exhibit, in metaverse, I was interested in ecology in the metaverse. And in the year 2010, I created the menstrual machine. So people who don't have menstruate, biological males, they put it on so that they can experience what it's like to menstruate. And I created the video and came up with an installation. And a lot of people got to know this. And back then, in 2010, when I came up with the menstrual machine, then half of the population on Earth is female. But menstruation for a long time has been taboo. It's as though it never existed. But women have to go through this every month or many women have to go through this every month. And they have pains and they bleed, that's what they experience. And then people act as though it doesn't exist. So I was frustrated. So I wanted anyone and everyone to be able to experience going through menstruation. And back in 2010, as I did this, I was questioning people. And back then, YouTube was still quite new as a media. And when I was a student, I upped this, and Professor Yuko Hasegawa unearthed me from YouTube. So I made my debut in a very, uh, back then, modern way. And now it's 2022. And regarding menstruation, uh, people talk about menstruation more in the media. In Japan, too, at last, people talk about menopause and menstruation. The world has changed. So this work, what was I trying to do? So in the metaverse, so this is a space where we spend a new life and Web3 is under a lot of attention. So in the metaverse, would, would I be able to menstruate? And there are avatars, so having a wearable tool so that male avatars and female avatars uh, in the metaverse, you can experience having a, a menstrual cycle. So I moved my machine to the metaverse, and you'll probably see this coming up later. So there are general male and female avatars, and this is not a pair of jeans, but you can see the blood or around your head. So this is like the PMS. You can feel heavy, your head feels heavy. People tell me it looks like a ghost, but that expresses the fuzziness of your head. So these avatars for experiencing menstruation, and this is Decentraland in the metaverse. This is the largest platform. And I made an application, and they said, in the metaverse, menstruating is prohibited. So they struck me down. I never thought that would happen. I was really surprised. This is the year, the year 2022, and this is menstruating on the web. Aren't we in a more inclusive world? But on the metaverse, you're not allowed to menstruate. And oh, maybe you can start again with a loop. Yes, the, the video before this one, please. And I was really taken back. And Decentraland, so this is a community that does the censusing. And this is a gaming environment. So it's mainly young men. And online, 
I was saying online, this is something that's really normal, but why can't you do it on the metaverse? And they were saying, not a drop of blood is, necess- is allowed. And I had a big fight with them, and I really tried hard. And in the past, there was a commercial for menstruation, napkins, and they used blue blood. So I was saying, if it's blue blood, is it possible? And they said, yes, if it's blue blood, it's okay. But that's, that's not a normal um, phenomenon. If I had blue blood, I would go to a hospital. So for me, my normal, what's normal for me? What's daily life for me, for them? In the metaverse, I regret to say, for young men, young men designers, what's normal was not normal. So menstruating and blood was something that shouldn't exist, or at least the blood should not be red, it should be blue. So that's the discussion I had. And at this exhibition, I wanted to show that discussion as well. And so this is a wearable device you can only use in a test environment, but I hope that one day we will be able to menstruate even in the metaverse. So with that in mind, I put this on show. And this is a wonderful opportunity. If I have a little more time, maybe I can show my next work. So this is, I, this is not on show this time, but Professor Kocha was talking about birth earlier on. So I wanted to mention this. Uh, could you give me a little more time, please? So right now, there's NFT art. And that's under attention right now, but I regret to say that NFT, it's very like speculation. People talk about the money and investments and what's possible using NFT regarding the substance. People don't really pay attention to that. And this project is, it's only a work in progress, but next month in London, I'll be announcing this. So NFT, so there's a smart contract. You can use the smart contract and using algorithms, for example, like a life form, something will grow or develop, or you can use DNA to grow, or you can have children. So something like life that grows, that you can nurture. I was hoping to make that into a work, and last year in September, I did have a child. I experienced childbirth, and while I was pregnant, my stomach kept on getting larger, and then I had a baby, and I'm a programmer too, and my husband's DNA and my DNA, and compile. (laughs) And that was really, really strange to me. I thought, this is really amazing. Something, Something complicated is created in this really simple way, and wow, everyone's doing this. So the programming, compiling, and then giving birth, it was really interesting. And this too, last next month, there are 100 NFTs. They each have different DNAs. And this is moving really fast. But after buying NFT, it took 40 weeks, and little by little, it changes. And can you see it? So the DNA is different for each. Maybe you can't see, but they're all each very different. The color and this. You see, and it's very refreshing. Can you see? Can you hear? Testing, testing. Professor Kocha, can you hear? Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay. And these are all coded. So on the blockchain, there's code. 
So I use this using Ethereum blockchain. And as long as the Ethereum blockchain exists, then the children that I have had will continue to exist on top of the Ethereum blockchain. So I studied computer sciences in university. I'm a programmer. So doing something like this, it's really fun. But through practical experience like this, thinking as I create and feeling the feel, I've been doing this for a long time, and this exhibit too, this feel. In a good sense of the word, there's things all over the place, and that's good, but thank you very much. And it's still work in progress, but next month I'll be releasing it. Okay, thank you. So from a variety of perspectives, you've been looking at the exhibit, and things are all over the place, you were saying. We've had wonderful comments. And today, Professor Kocha's lecture regarding this too, in a variety of ways, feedback. Let's deepen the discussion a little more. So, Professor Shinohara, to Professor Kocha, I think you have feedback. Uh, yes, I have questions for Professor Kocha. So, Professor Kocha, I'll speak in Japanese, but the, so, Latour, you do a lot of communication with Latour, I think. And I was reading an interview, and Professor Kocha was saying, disclaimer of Latour, disclaimer. So maybe you're a little critical of Latour. And how should I put this? So regarding Latour, it's not like I read a lot of Latour's works, but he is, in one, in one of his essays, he talked about the Dipesh Davaldi, and he interpreted it this way. There's the human world and nature and continuity. There's the discussion of getting back continuity. And he was reading... The, but what Professor Kocha is saying is metamorphosis. At the beginning of your book, you talk about continuity. So continuity of life. That's what you talk in the beginning of your book. So our life, what we imagine to be the most intimate and communicable part of ourselves, does not come from us, and there is nothing exclusive or personal about it. You were talking about that, and you say, it was transmitted to us by others. It has animated other bodies, chunks of matter different from the world in which we are currently harbored. So, others that you talk about, or personally, you cannot be personal or exclusive. So something that doesn't belong to yourself. That's how you see life, which means that the otherness or the simplistic continuity, maybe it's not just simple continuity. That's something you're paying attention to when you talk about continuity. So Professor Kocha talks about continuity of life. When you say that, the way you grasp continuity seems to be rather unique. And I was hoping that you could give me a little more explanation about your continuity. And I'm not quite sure how much relationship there is to your presentation today, but could you please explain a little bit about your continuity? So thank you so much. Uh, uh, um, I would not comment the... the the question about uh, my relationship with uh, Bruno Latour, also I would, perhaps <laughs> you should ask him. I don't think that we are on the same position. We have a lot of quarrels and we, I mean, we, we have a lot of discussions. Well, of course, we, we love each other, but we start from uh, very different positions and we are going also toward different uh, uh, directions. Also because he's coming from social sciences, I'm coming from uh, natural sciences. Uh, his point is to bridge the human word with the, as he call uh, the non-human word, to me, I mean, the, the problem I had in this book, the problem I had tried to discuss in the metamorphosis, in not, it's not even the relationship between human and non-human, which to me sounds already a theological discussion. The question is, what is the relationship among all species? And that's the point. The point is the relationship among all species is the continuity. 
what do I mean or what do I try to, what did I try to understand? The, what I want to, um, I, I would say, I would say just two points. First of all, my, my, my goal was to deny that the multiplicity of life forms is a substantial one. So we normally uh, think that the that there is humanity, and then to be a squirrel, and then to be an oak, and these forms are sub substances. They, that there is a substantial ontological divide between me and the squirrel. The point of the book was to say, no, the division, the multiplicity of a species is an accidental one. There is just one and single life among all species. The proof of that is, for instance, birth. Why? So you said this kind of very strange experience, but let's think of uh, birth in this way. Actually, birth is the transmission of flesh from an, an, an individual to another, which means that flesh that we used to consider as something private, as something uh, like uh, extremely exclusive, is, that, is it something like a coin, it's like money, so flesh is like, something which circulates all the time during all the history of life. So my flesh is the flesh of two different people, which also was the flesh of other peoples, and there is a continuity, a material continuity, till the beginning of life. So the, my flesh is the flesh of the very first living being, and because of that, my flesh is the flesh of Gaia. So there is no material uh, interruption in this process. That's, that's birth. Birth is the like the necessity of this material continuity of all living beings, which is the necessity of the circulation of flesh among all individuals and among all species. So flesh is the most public, the most common uh, element in life. And another point where you can see that is alimentation. So every time that you uh, eat something, you are in a way, mixing your flesh with something else, or you are taking the flesh of an individual which is belonging to another species, which means two things. First of all, that our body is a cosmic battery. So our body is like the space of mixing of every, so we used to think as a body as something totally human. So my body is a mix of uh, pork, cows, tomatoes, uh, uh, I don't know, a lot of species are there and the flesh is like just the mixing of all of them. And also, and this is why alimentation is so, from a speculative point of view, so it's a scandal, because to eat something means, first of all, to see that the life which is animating, I don't know, the pork, is able to animate you without any problems. So life is a sort of war which can go everywhere without posing it to itself limits. So, And secondly, so eating something means also to produce a sort of equality among species. Every time that you eat and everything, every time that you are eaten, so it, it happens, <laughs> not so much, but it happens. After, the, after we, we will die, we will be eaten by someone. So this is a destiny that we cannot escape. So we can, so, so to say, but, so our life transform itself into the life of something else. So that's why, that's what I mean uh, under continuity. So there is, life is made in order to circulate all the time, and that's why you, you were right when you said there is perhaps the concept of end is like a totally stupid God. I, I would have an answer why in uh, Western, why in Christianity or in Christian society, uh, in Christian societies, the end of life is so important, but it's a theological reason, it's not a, a biological reason. So from a biological point of view, life never stops in a way. So. Thank you. May I ask a very weird, strange question? When I gave birth to my child, I had a very strange feeling, as I said earlier. 
I went to university and I studied computer science and math. And finally, I started programming and creating a metabus. And creating something is really, really difficult, and you have to learn about it. But then my womb has never learned to create such a complex being, so it was quite strange to me. Everyone is doing this. Everyone is producing a baby. Everyone around the world is creating this complex thing in the womb. And it was very strange to me. It's like the flesh was flowing, but the intelligence of my womb. So I eat, and then the eyes and arms of my baby were created. So this is an intelligence, and I was wondering how to interpret this. My womb was not learning anything. My womb didn't study about this, but then my womb was able to create this complex being. So what do you think about this? It's a very strange question. No, no, it's not strange at all. On the contrary, <laughs> it's uh, like, uh, for, first of all, uh, just before answering you, there is, uh, I would say that, uh, I mean, I never experienced that. I should not speak about that because I'm a male, so I will never, but to me, but I must say, first of all, that to assist to the birth of my daughter was the most important experience in my life. They changed everything, really everything. And it's like, you know, in the ancient Greeks, uh, you have this uh, concept of mysteries, which are very trivial experience, but they, they change your life. So, th so that was, to me, uh, this kind of experience. And what is strange to me of, uh, of birth is also the kind of uh, character of monstrosity of uh, giving birth because uh, a mother is someone who is both like two who has two bodies who has two sexes two heads two four lungs it's like whoa it's and we never or we re barely realize how 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 close a mother is to a monster in a way so in a not in a negative sense in something uh, which is like uh, but concerning the fact that it's like in a way, art at its most powerful uh, form, uh, the giving birth. There is actually a, tradi a very long tradition in uh, in Europe, in, uh, uh, in the European um, philosophy or medicine, uh, which was the idea that in order to understand what art is, uh, and under art in uh, in uh, in Greek and Roman antiquity. Um, uh, you had to consider both technology and artistic because the the word is the same in Greek and Latin. To 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 say art, you have to to use the same uh, uh, the same name for technology. So there is no. But in the in uh, in this tradition, uh, the idea was that in order to understand what technology is, you have to look to a great a seed, which is a, a kind of womb. Why? Because uh, they say that they, there is uh, the, the philosophers who used to say that uh, they, they were called stoi stoics. Uh, and the idea was when you are looking to a seed, you see what is normally happening to an artist. So for, for an artist, you have the artist, you have the, the work, and then the process, but everything is separated. Uh, whereby in the seed, you have the artist, the process of art, the matter where the artist is uh, uh, producing its influence and the result, which is which are just one piece of matter. So that's why it's so miraculous. Uh, so seed is like art at its best. Uh, and it was interesting, this kind of tradition, because of two reasons. First of all, in order to say the world is full of seeds, so the world is full of art. And secondly, it was important also because it is from this tradition that comes the idea of genes. In a way, we do not realize that because we are speaking about genes uh, um, in a linguistic, we're using linguistic metaphors, but genes uh, are pieces of matters which are able to produce forms out of themselves without the help of anything else. So they are really artists. Perhaps we should change the language of genetics and introduce, insufflate artistic metaphors in the build, but they are artists in a way. So.
So you are totally right and in this. Uh, yeah, it's amazing that it's just code, code that produces something so complicated in but only just like nine months, which was really crazy experience. But, so, yeah. but, but you have a lot of uh, coders in your home. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> You're like uh, billions They're of coders. They're reading code and yeah. taking pro making proteins, yeah, exactly. putting proteins together. But so, so crazy experience, but next. <laughs> Professor Ishikura, regarding Professor Kocha. Yes, Can you hear me? No, you cannot hear? Yes? Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. And what I recalled was, as Professor Kocha was saying, the mother and the child, it's a monster with two lives. And something similar, Mr. Miki Shigeo, he teaches at, he used to teach at the University of Arts here, and a mother, during the nine or ten months, so they are repeating the whole history of mankind. And so, so this was like a theory regarding individuals and uh, the, whole, the whole species. And this is grasped as a dream. So a child that's born in the sea, the life, when it comes out from the sea onto land, it feels uh, the birth pains. And as it gets bigger, it becomes human. So in that respect, he was talking about life memories. And this is memories that overcome species. And in the mother's womb, the codes are handed down. And so it's not a Christian theology that talks about the body and the spirit, but the Eastern way of thinking is Goethe's uh, thoughts were mixed in. And at the Tokyo University of Art, when I heard Professor Miki, so I heard a lot from the others who were students at the time. And it's not just the history and, and uh, logics of art. It's what happens when a child is born. There was an opportunity to learn at university, and probably this is very important information. And Professor Sputniko was saying she didn't learn about this, but I think you probably get input a lot. And what you get as input is input into your child. This is not intentional education, but as animals. So this is half what we do unintentionally, unconsciously as animals. And that's where the memories reside. And that's interesting. And Professor Miki was saying, animals, so if you flip over the intestines of an animal, it becomes a plant. So, so there's constantly coming and going between animals and plants. And I believe that right now in Japan, uh, he's someone that we should study more. Thank you very much. I think we are now thinking about a concept of life. In a sense, it's very interesting, but I think the members of the audience are quite interested in arts. So from my side to Professor Kocha, I have a question. So this might be a separate topic, but Professor Kocha, you talk to many philosophers, uh, philosophers, but then you like to talk to uh, many artists. You said that talking to artists uh, is quite inspiring. So the ideas of artists who create something new, I think you, ha you can learn from uh, these artists. So what kind of inspiration do you get from conversations with such artists? What what is the uh, nutrition or food for thought that you get from artists? So thank you so much. First of all, uh, I must say that uh, since a quite a uh, bit of time, I'm, I'm not just taking inspiration uh, from artists, I'm just living just among artists. So in, uh, in Paris, I'm seeing never ever 
uh, philosophers. <laughs> I don't know. It came. It came out. It's not. It was not a decision. It was like uh, this uh, unintentional uh, uh, memory. So it's. It, it came out like that because Paris is like it's full of artists. But there is also. It's. It's not just a biographical stupid anecdote. There is. I think a very deep. Um, how can I say? Uh, um, um, insight in me, which is the fact that what is interesting, what we call today art, after let's say, or since uh, since uh, a century, what what contemporary art is uh, is the fact when art managed to free itself from a single medium, from the fact that you are an artist if you are able to I don't know to put some pigments on a canvas or to sculpt uh, a piece of matter or bronze or to make a film. When artists became, uh, in the, in, let's say, in the 20th century, the fact that you are producing forms starting from any kind of matter, even not from matter if you are a conceptual artist, then art became just the most general, the most universal form of thinking a uh, mass general, not because it's like producing forms with everything you have, even with something which is not material, but because it is a way of thinking where you have, first of all, to design and to form the matter, and then to produce the form. And that's why art is, to me, more interesting than uh, philosophy, because in a way, philosophy is just a very uh, lazy form of thinking. You are uh, thinking that think just means to put a word under, uh, after the other, whereby when you are uh, in, an artist, you have to invent what could be a word, but what could be just a line of coding or a photograph or a piece of uh, wood. And this is so amazing. Why? Because as a philosopher, I mean, I think that uh, you... I don't know what philosophy is, and nobody knows actually. But uh, you become, I, I think that you become a philosopher because you are just amazed by thinking. And art, in a way, proves that thinking is everywhere. In every piece of matter, there is a form of thinking. And that's so amazing. So that's why art is so important to me. So, for philosophers, there are words. So, there are frameworks and there are fields, but artists overcome those boundaries and they're very comprehensive. Therefore, I love being an artist. And I often call myself an artist. But, for example, recently, I've started my own company, and as an extension of my artworks, I founded my company. And it comes from the menstrual machine, but in Japan now, big companies like NEC, Yahoo, Shiseido, I provide my works to them, so regarding menopause and women becoming pregnant, for the companies to support women who are experiencing this. I offer something that I have created as art, but it's turned into a startup. But art has the power to do that, I think. So with philosophy too, so even with a startup, or even with paintings, or with code, whatever you use, it's okay to use anything, I think. Okay, thank you. So, we need to wrap up. I've been told wrap-ups, but if you each have a few words, please go ahead. So, it seems we have to wrap up. So, Professor Kocha, you talked about... So create the matter and then create the form, produce the form. So when you say a matter, 
For example, um, I was working with Kawauchi, the professor, and she uses the shadows and the lights. And as Professor Kocha said, the immaterial matter or ambience is also used in the art. So the light and something that you cannot really capture, but the ambience or atmosphere, I think it's very interesting that you focus on such aspect, but um, we don't have much time to talk about this in depth. In depth. Well, since uh, the interpreters have to leave, uh, we were originally planning to conclude the session at 7.30. Um, but since we started late, uh, we will be ending uh, later than scheduled, but we'd like to wrap up now. It was a very inspiring session. So Bruno Latour, the name of Bruno Latour came from a French artist, and Timothy, um, the name of Timothy came from a French artist, and Professor Kocha, I heard from a Brazilian artist, and then I started studying um, these philosophers. So artists told me about these philosophers and these new ideas. So artists already knew about these new ideas before I did. So I think that we are creating the world in parallel. And as a result, I was able to invite Professor Kocha. And I am not just a facilitator conveying his messages and thoughts to you. So I think it's very interesting that we are connecting this way. I was just, I was not actively learning uh, Professor Kocha's work, but I heard from an artist in Rio de Janeiro, and then um, this person said that I should know about uh, your work. So that's how you are going to Professor Kocha. Thank you very much. So uh, Inomata-san is there. Uh, she is one of the artists. And Nagasaka-san. Nagasaka-san is also here. Thank you. So this concludes the symposium. If you are interested, please read the book. Uh, this is the book about the talk and interview with Professor Kocha. Thank you.